the most powerful weapon on earth is undoubtedly the human mind. Our minds have allowed us to inhabit virtually every climate and geography on earth. Best every predator or disaster nature has to confront us as well. And that's before we get into human creations like nuclear weaponry or things like CRISPR which let us bend creation to our will. But despite being attached to it and hopefully using it on a daily basis, the human mind remains mysterious in some very huge ways. For example, you still won't find a scientific explanation for our unique consciousness, how it came to be and why. And if it was a natural occurrence, why are we the only ones? Does free will exist? Or is destiny determined at the outset? These topics are, of course, where religion flourishes, offering accounts of creation and reasons for existence, as well as why we are so different from the animals. And you may not call it a religion, but even some ideas about aliens are really doing the same thing in more ways than you might realize, just with different language and a little less in between the lines. The mind is mostly a mystery, it seems. We don't even know how we store and access mundane memories, or fully understand how or why it is that we perceive reality, and even more incredibly, time, in the first place. But I want to focus on something we've all experienced, that is still equally mysterious to our own attempts at understanding ourselves. Dreams and visions. So why do we dream? No one really knows the answer to that question either. And do dreams have any sort of meaning or purpose? No one really knows what to make of that. There are plenty of attempts to answer that question, though. Some scientists suggest dreams are meaningless. Others say that they're a window into your subconscious mind, connecting you to emotions that you may not even be aware of. Some research also suggests that dreams may play a role in forming and storing memories or processing emotions. If you check out WebMD, they still have to address the idea that more than a few people have that dreams might be windows into the past, present, or even the future. So what do you think? Could they just be nothing? Could they be meaningful connections to your subconscious? And could there be some borderline magic, paranormal, or supernatural force behind dreams? I think it's safe to say that we've all experienced all three of those premises. I've had lots of random nonsensical dreams myself, but I've also had dreams that seemed true, if a bit weird, in regards to feelings or emotions about situations in my life. And I'd wager most people have at least experienced that feeling of deja vu, even if they don't have some concrete explanation for it. And maybe even a lucid dream happens here or there. That's where you're aware that you're dreaming, but the dream still plays out. It's not surprising, then, that in many cases, discussion of dreams often involves the world of the paranormal, psychics, fortune tellers, and even religions, and they've all played important roles in world events that have served to shape entire cultures. For this episode, we'll take a look at some specific dreams from humanity's past. The first set of dreams come from one of the oldest written stories on Earth, the Epic of Gilgamesh which I did a couple of episodes on. You can go check out later if you haven't already. There are several prominent dreams in the Epic of Gilgamesh, and the first two occur very early on in the story. Gilgamesh first dreams of a meteor that crashes into the earth. All the town folk are in awe of the object, but Gilgamesh, the powerful demigod, is unable to budge the meteor. But he's strangely drawn to it, and the feeling he has about it, he describes as, as equally powerful to that which draws men to women. Ultimately, the people help Gilgamesh move the meteor, and he brings it to his mother. The second dream in Gilgamesh comes immediately after the first dream, and is about a large, beautiful axe that appears laying on the streets of Uruk. Gilgamesh, again, drawn to the axe, takes the axe and proudly wears it on his waist. In the story... Gilgamesh's mother tells him that both of these dreams are about a coming companion that is just as strong as Gilgamesh, but will be like his brother, travel with him, and always be loyal. It's significant in this part of the story 
because at this point, Gilgamesh has no equal. And that equal, of course, is Enkidu. Not long after the arrival of Enkidu, Gilgamesh has yet another dream, which isn't really described in the story, but it is interpreted by Enkidu to mean that Gilgamesh's destiny is as a powerful king, but not an immortal one. And this really becomes kind of a central theme of the Epic of Gilgamesh. On Gilgamesh and Enkidu's first adventure to take on the monster called Humbaba, Gilgamesh has three more dreams that all seem terrifying at first. Fighting a bull, being like a fly next to a collapsing mountain, and the light leaving the world and the world turning to ashes. All of these are basically nightmares that keep Gilgamesh from sleeping as he and Enkidu prepare to fight the monster. Enkidu, though, seeking to reassure his friend, explains that all these dreams are just signs that they're going to win. Later in the story, after the death of Enkidu and as Gilgamesh is on his quest for immortality, he also prays for a vision or dream, hoping to get some guidance. So in the Epic of Gilgamesh, the first three dreams are prophetic in nature. The first two telling of the coming of Enkidu, his best friend and equal. The third dream informs him that he will be a great king, but not an immortal, which is perhaps foreshadowing of his ultimate failure to achieve immortality in the end, but maybe also a window into his subconscious fears, Gilgamesh being incredibly proud and all. The nightmares he experiences on his hunt for Humbaba are absolutely the subconscious at work, and with good reason. They'd set off on a journey to slay a ferocious monster, out of boredom. So at this point, they'd been traveling for days, but nothing to think about except the coming conflict with the monster. I think we can all relate to that feeling of anxiety, and the sleepless nights, one way or another. The last instance is Gilgamesh seeking some supernatural guidance. He'd just lost his best friend, and was on a desperate quest to the ends of the earth, seeking immortality because of his great fear of death. So, while I'm mentioning the name Gilgamesh, I'll move into the Book of Giants, which I also covered in a previous episode. The Book of Giants is almost entirely made up of the giants, monsters, and fallen angels in the alleged world before the flood of Noah, having ominous dreams about their demise at the hand of God. In one dream, the Gilgamesh of this story tells of a great tree that is uprooted, except for three of the roots, which are taken by the good angels and planted in a garden. Another dream in the story is of a garden with some 200 trees being tended to, but the garden is then set on fire and destroyed. Many of the characters in this book have dreams and visions, all progressively more ominous than the last, culminating in a direct dream of God wiping out the corruption on the earth which included the giants. Ancient Egypt even has a book of dreams that attempts to take certain actions or scenes from a dream and interpret their meaning. There are 108 different dreams in the 3,000-plus-year-old copy we have, and the interpretations are actually pretty straightforward. For example, if a man sees himself in a dream where his bed is catching fire, it's a bad omen and it means he's driving his wife away. But even with that, one instance of ancient Egypt's priests' failure to interpret dreams might be even more famous. Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing on the bank of the Nile River. In his dream, he saw seven fat, healthy cows come up out of the river and begin grazing in the marsh grass. Then he saw seven more cows come up from behind them, from the Nile. But these were scrawny and thin. These cows stood beside the fat cows on the riverbank. Then, the scrawny thin cows ate the seven healthy fat cows. At this point in the dream, Pharaoh woke up. But he fell asleep again, and he had a second dream. This time, he saw seven heads of grain, plump and beautiful, growing on a single stalk. Then, seven more heads of grain appeared. But these were shriveled and withered by the east wind. And these thin heads swallowed up the seven plump, well-formed heads. Then Pharaoh woke up again and realized it was a dream. The next morning, Pharaoh was very disturbed by the dreams, 
So he called for all of the magicians and wise men of Egypt. When Pharaoh told them his dreams, not one of them could tell him what they meant. Finally, the king's chief cupbearer spoke up. Today I have been reminded of my failure, he told Pharaoh. Some time ago, you were angry with the chief baker and me, and you imprisoned us in the palace of the captain of the guard. One night, the chief baker and I each had a dream, and each dream had its own meaning. There was a young Hebrew man with us in the prison, who was a slave of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams, and he told us what each of our dreams meant. And everything happened just as he had predicted. I was restored to my position as cupbearer, and the chief baker was executed and impaled on a pole. Pharaoh sent for Joseph at once, and he was quickly brought from the prison. After he shaved and changed his clothes, he went in and stood before Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream last night, and no one here can tell me what it means. But I have heard that when you hear about a dream, you can interpret it. It is beyond my power to do this, Joseph replied. But God can tell you what it means and set you at ease. So Pharaoh told Joseph his dream. In my dream, he said, I was standing on the bank of the Nile River, and I saw seven fat, healthy cows come up out of the river and begin grazing in the marsh grass. But then I saw seven sick-looking cows, scrawny and thin, come up after them. I've never seen such sorry-looking animals in all the land of Egypt. These thin, scrawny cows ate the seven fat cows. But afterward, you wouldn't have known it for they were still as thin and scrawny as before. And then I woke up. In my dream I also saw seven heads of grain, full and beautiful, growing on a single stalk. Then seven more heads of grain appeared, but these were blighted, shriveled, and withered by the east wind. And the shriveled heads swallowed the seven healthy heads. I told these dreams to my magicians, but no one could tell me what they mean. Joseph responded, Both of Pharaoh's dreams mean the same thing. God is telling Pharaoh in advance what he is about to do. The seven healthy cows and the seven healthy heads of grain both represent seven years of prosperity. The seven thin scrawny cows that came up later and the seven thin heads of grain withered by the east wind represent seven years of famine. This will happen just as I have described it. For God has revealed to Pharaoh in advance what he is about to do. The next seven years will be a period of great prosperity throughout the land of Egypt. But afterward, there will be seven years of famine so great that all the prosperity will be forgotten in Egypt. Famine will destroy the land. This famine will be so severe that even the memory of the good years will be erased. As for having two similar dreams, it means that these events have been decreed by God, and he will soon make them happen. Therefore Pharaoh should find an intelligent and wise man and put him in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh should appoint supervisors over the land and let them collect one-fifth of all the crops during the seven good years. Have them gather all the food produced in the good years that are just ahead and bring it to Pharaoh's storehouses. Store it away and guard it so that there will be food in the cities. That way there will be enough to eat when the seven years of famine come to the land of Egypt. Otherwise, this famine will destroy the land. Genesis chapter 41 Now, Joseph, of course, goes on to become that intelligent and wise man Pharaoh puts in charge of the grain. The famine is managed very well, and that story arc sets up a pretty important story arc in Judaism and Christianity. Now, on that note, the Bible has no shortage of visions and dreams. The prophet Daniel was skilled at interpreting dreams as well. And for this story, we head to ancient Babylon. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled, and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream, 
and we will interpret it. The king replied to the astrologers, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards of great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Once more they replied, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will interpret it. Then the king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time, because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is only one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then, tell me the dream, and I will know that you could interpret it for me. The astrologers answered the king, There is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends and put them to death. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, Why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went in to the king and asked for time, so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, also called Belthazar, Are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. Your dream and the visions that passed through your mind as you were lying in your bed are these. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds in the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. After you, 
another kingdom will arise, inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. For iron breaks and smashes everything, and as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw the feet and toes were partly baked of clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering of incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all of its wise men. Daniel Chapter 2. There are many shorter sequences involving dreams and visions in the Bible, including Joseph dreaming that he should take Mary as his wife and raise the unborn child. And later, Pontius Pilate's wife has troubling dreams about the arrest of Jesus before the crucifixion. From beginning to the literal end of the world, as seen by John in the book of Revelation, the Bible is full of dreams. There is even a verse saying visions and dreams will become more common in the end times. And I feel like I should also mention that it was a vision that convinced the Roman Emperor Constantine to become a Christian. But the Bible, as we can partly see in the book of Daniel, through Nebuchadnezzar's distrust of his astrologers, also warns that dreams can be misleading and downright false, and that false prophets and bogus interpretations are likewise very real. So certainly not all dreams are created equal, and many of them may amount to nothing at all. But let's skip around a little bit and leave the Middle East and look at a few dream stories from other places. There's a Japanese folk tale of a young man who leaves his wife to go travel for business. And as he travels and is gone for a while, he begins to miss his wife. And so he decides that he'll turn soon and leave for home. While resting one night, he dreams of his wife having dinner with and eventually lying down with another man in his absence. As he moves to open the door, he wakes up. This makes him want to head home faster than ever. Except when he gets home, he finds his wife waiting for him, and learns that she had the same dream, though about him lying with someone else. Which to me seems like a pretty cut and dry example of emotions like loneliness, longing, or maybe even fear leading to a dream. In this case, that particular dream seems reasonable for a married couple. There's another Japanese story that tells of being able to steal someone's dream by hearing them tell the story and then repeating it verbatim to the interpreter. Which sort of vaguely reminds me of the idea of keeping a birthday wish secret or not telling people what you wished for when you saw a shooting star. The ancient Greeks even had a god named Morpheus, who was the literal son of the god of sleep who along with his brothers were responsible for all the things that you see in dreams, both real and imagined, and occasionally delivering messages from the other gods themselves. There's also a Native American symbol related to dreams that I'm sure you've seen at some point, the dream catcher. Dream catchers probably originate with the Ojibwe Native Americans, and a character referred to as Asibakashi, or Spider Woman. The Spider Woman was like a deity of sorts, she looked after the people by helping Grandfather Sun return each day. She did this by catching sunlight in the dew on her webs that she spun each night. 
Her webs also trapped bad dreams, or bad energy, and kept them from getting to the people while they slept. Spiders do tend to catch a lot of bugs at night. Native Americans are also broadly famous for the general idea of the vision quest, which varies quite a bit in form and in practice from group to group, but almost always consists of intentionally seeking interaction with the supernatural or spirit world, whether through dreams, isolation, fasting, or in some cases, using hallucinogens. And if we fast forward, did you know that Nikola Tesla claimed his design for the AC motor that made him famous came to him in a vision while walking through a park and reciting a passage about dreams from the legendary German tale of Faust? In Tesla's own words, The sun was just setting and reminded me of the glorious passage. It jerks and gives way. The day has survived. There it rushes and demands new life. Oh, since no wing will lift me off the ground, and you will always strive. A beautiful dream, however, is escaping. Oh, on the wings of the spirit will be so easily, no physical wing will join. As I uttered these inspiring words, the idea came like a flash of lightning, and in an instant the truth was revealed. I drew with a stick on the sand, the diagram shown six years later in my address before the American Institute of Electrical Engineers, and my companion understood them perfectly. The images I saw were wonderfully sharp and clear, and had the solidity of metal and stone. So much so, that I told him, See my motor here? Watch me reverse it. I cannot begin to describe my emotions. Pygmalion seeing his statue come to life could not have been more deeply moved. A thousand secrets of nature, which I might have stumbled upon accidentally, I would have given for that one which I had wrestled from her against all odds, and at the peril of my existence. So what do you think about dreams and visions? Are they all just random bits of information jumbled together in our subconscious? Are they reflections of our current state of emotions, even ones we couldn't or wouldn't express publicly? Could it really be a connection to the supernatural, as so many throughout history seem to have believed? I think maybe it's a mixture of all of the above. I'll share a dream I had a few years ago, during a stressful time in my own life, that I still remember very well to this day, over at loreandlegends.net, which I will link to in the episode description. That blog post will also include notes and references for this episode. And if you have a dream of your own, definitely share it in the comments. You can even do it anonymously without logging in if you wish, but I'd love to hear it. And be sure to subscribe wherever you listen. And if you could, leave me a five-star review on Apple and share the podcast with someone who you think might be interested. That really helps Lauren Legends continue to grow. And if you're feeling extra generous, visit buymeacoffee.com slash Lauren Legends and buy me a coffee. Now we aren't quite done with the mysterious human mind just yet. The coming future episodes will delve further into alleged psychic abilities, even ones the U.S. government may have paid for. So stay tuned. That's all for this episode. See you next time. The music in this episode, in order of occurrence. The Complex, by Kevin McLeod, available at filmmusic.io. I actually have a license for that one. Desert City, by Kevin McLeod, available at filmmusic.io. Licensed under Creative Commons, by Attribution 4.0. Tabic, by Kevin McLeod, available at filmmusic.io. Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0. Gregorian Chant by Kevin McLeod. Available at filmmusic.io. Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0. And Sky of Our Ancestors. Also by Kevin McLeod. Available at filmmusic.io. Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0.